the chairman, our executive director, the council members, as well as fellows of the institute and colleagues in the HR profession, a very good morning to you and welcome to the launch of the HR month. Indeed, it's a pleasure to have everybody with us. And um, before we, you know, hand over to um, Irene to be able to sort of give some opening remarks, I think from where I sit, it's long been recognized that HR practitioners have the influence to positively impact the lives of the employees as well as those of the people that we serve within our community. And COVID has taught us this very quickly that HR actually plays within an organization from being in charge of business continuity planning to being counselors to business partners. I feel that this pandemic has enabled us to grow very quickly. And so it's such a great privilege that today we are able to be here to be able to celebrate and you know the HR professions who work tirelessly to ensure that the wheels of organizations keep moving day in, day out. So without further ado, allow me to introduce Irene, who's um, the current executive director of the Institute. She will give a few remarks and then introduce the chairman who will then um, gracefully launch the theme for this month. So Irene Karibusana. All right, thank you very much, Rose. I hope that I am audible. Uh, we are trying to, to make sure that we are keeping the distance and still engaging and communicating. Uh, we are happy that members have joined uh, this platform for the official launch of the HR month. Indeed, this is the first time that we are doing an official launch. In the past, we have participated in HR month activities, career fairs, we have had the golf tournaments, we have had uh, uh, sessions with, uh, with students and members have volunteered their time and their expertise to do that. And uh, this is the first time we are officially uh, launching and it has a top on the cake, uh, a topping on the cake because we're in Mombasa. I think we're the characters who are waiting for the, the, the borders to be opened because we were feeling very restricted in Nairobi and we, we are happy to be in Mombasa and to see our economy continue to open up. And we are hosted by the branch officials of the uh, Mombasa branch. Uh, Council member Mr. Tisero will be joining us as we proceed. So thank you so much, branch officials, for, for having us. And we are happy to, to, to do this. And this is the beginning of many in the spirit of devolution, like uh, our council intends that we get to, to the ground and we get to support our membership and, and to have the membership lead in the initiative that we are having. So I would like to invite uh, Mr. Hezron Rachilo, who is the chair of the Mombasa branch, to introduce his team and to introduce himself, and then we can get back to the national chairman. Thank you. Uh, Asante, uh, Idi, and uh, on behalf of uh, the HR fraternity in the country, we really welcome the uh, institute leadership to the coast and eastern chapter, Kariguri yeah, uh, it's a great honor that we, Mombasa has been chosen to host uh, this fourth HR month. And we believe that uh, in the spirit of devolution, the other chapters will also have an opportunity as we continue with the HR month as a practice. Uh, allow me now to introduce the leadership of the Coast Eastern chapter that is represented here. On my left is uh, Eli. Yangueso. Eli is the vice chairman of the chapter. Uh, on my further right is uh, Madam Masi. Masi is the secretary of the chapter. <coughs> and uh, on my extreme left is our colleague uh, Chris Saina, who is a committee member. Um, Esther, who is the treasurer to the chapter, will be joining us later, together with Dr. Ibua, who is our committee member. And we have apologies from two of our members. Uh, that is Bona Musioka. Sorry, only one member will not be attending today. Uh, that is Bona Musioka, who had some uh, pre-planned uh, activities. I get back to you now, uh, Ibi, and continue from there. 
All right. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Machilo, and thank you all members for taking the time uh, of your day to come and join us for this launch. Uh, because we are late, sorry we kept you late, but I'm sure the chairman will explain why. Uh, I do not want to say much, and we know we have Dr. Kipnetich, and we, as always, we look forward to listening to him. So it's over to you, National Chair. Okay, thank you very much all the organizers of this. I want to spare a special thank you to the membership on the edge of our IHRM fraternity and all the members of the institute, the secretariat, and a um, special thank you to Rose. And our guest for today, Dr. Julius Kipnetich, who is our good friend and is actually now I can call him an HR um, guru. Uh, he's been helping and advising us in many instances even when the whole issue of COVID started, I think he was one of our first speakers to take us through how to get ourselves prepared. And we've, been, we've done really pretty well. Um, I'll start by saying that it's, it's, uh, now we are in our fourth year of celebrating HR Month. Um, and um, in the past three years, we've had a lot of varied activities. Just going back to basics to check uh, what is it that we've done how do we celebrate success and the achievement that we've made over the period? And um, I'm really excited. It's really um, a nice time uh, to say congratulations and um, pat all the HR people on the back by telling them you've actually done a good job. You've actually made a great difference in uh, the fraternity and in the management of people in our organizations and in um, the places where we make contribution. Uh, I will be really quite brief this time and um, allow members so that uh, Dr. Kipnitich, our chief guest, can take us through. But as we are all aware that uh, this is a very special one. And um, we are in Mombasa actually not just to, for this launch, but we are having uh, two, three reasons why we are down here uh, in, uh, in the coast. Um, but the council members, we had a long meeting at the council, Zoom meeting. Of course, most of them are back in Nairobi. All of them are actually back in Nairobi. But um, we uh, I'd like to make a um, pronouncement to the HR fraternity that the term of um, the HR branch officials is coming to an end uh, next week. So we are here timely, and this is what the council will be doing each year, getting in touch with our members so that they can early enough give us how their experiences were, we, what would be the areas of improvement uh, as council, as the leadership, what is it that the people would want us to do more of and less of, and so on and so forth. So we decided to have this engagement as the exit office. Some we are going to maintain, um, and then we still the office bearers, depending on how the election goes, we still do not know, but we believe that they've also made a great contribution. So together for this uh, team. Our team for this year's HR month is holistic wellness, reset, restart, and relearn. The council and the institute have thought through all the topics and seen all the topics that we've engaged with, with the commencement of the pandemic, COVID pandemic. And we've seen all these things are clustering towards this, that we need to reset our thinking, we need to restart our livelihoods, our souls and our approaches, and we need to relearn new things. This looks really quite simple, simply put, but it can be really tedious. And I think quite a number of HR professionals who have gone through this in the, on the people management at this time have actually experienced how difficult it can be and how easy as well it can, it can look when you are restarting things and when you are starting uh, when we're giving a holistic approach. Uh, wellness is the condition of being in optimum health. It is the holistic blend of the physical, mental, and spiritual well-being of the result of this conscious choosing of the night to live a quality life. The path of natural health and wellness is a long life journey that requires personal responsibility and commitment. Yeah. What we are saying is that wellness is in good physical and mental health Improving your physical health can improve your mental health. Yes, I have replied. Our problems in one area can impact on another, and it is critical to make healthy choices for your body, mind, and what we call spirit or soul. Um, we, it is all about your mind, your body, and soul. Uh, we've had quite a number of webinars, and um, 
and um, learnings. And what does this all tell us that we really need to adjust? I'll not talk so much about uh, the, uh, the theme for today because we've got a guest speaker going to take us through. But uh, throughout the sessions and the many webinars, I'd like to pinpoint a few things that we've learned as HR professionals in this country. Number one thing that personally I've learned about the HR practice, what I need to move away from, from uh, as a result of this uh, pandemic, is that change it can be instant. And what happens? You, we all need to change instantly, including in our beliefs. You've seen the lessons we've learned of this um, as a result of the directives by government, including even our cultural um, practices, especially where I come from, where burial rights are really, 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 <laughs> you know, you have to, and people have to learn. And if you do not learn, then you are forced to do the same. And, uh, hey, uh, the government, uh, what government decided to do is to decide that we have to this day before so that uh, people will adapt. And then so and that is what tell, my tell Ali. And, and this was very interesting just a couple of weeks ago, to move away from what we used to call head count when it comes to staff and go to what we call heart count. And this applies to our emotional well-being, our emotional intelligence. That every time we are out there busy counting the number of people, and this should go very um, straight, especially to the HR pr practitioners in um, county governments, and we are really fond of that because we believe that uh, work is assessed by you physically being there, and therefore we count your heads. And we are saying, dude, the biggest learning out of this uh, COVID pandemic is that I'll be moving away from counting those heads because they don't apply anymore to me, and start counting the hearts. How do I manage the people through their hearts so that it can resonate to their heads, they can apply, and I can maximize on this? For me, that was a really, 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 really big one. Last and not least, from the very many seminars and um, and um, and um, meetings that we've had and um, managed, is that the physical is very, very important. Physical well-being, we need a person in totality, and it draws back to our theme that we are managing human beings. We are managing human beings. Therefore, the humanity, that feeling of knowing that this person or this, uh, this, this individual coming to work is actually a human being is of utmost importance. And technology will facilitate. Other things, finance will facilitate. Resources will facilitate. But the person we are looking at for purposes of productivity for purposes of ensuring that the ongoing, that the works are, for the purposes of the entire well-being of ourselves, of our organization, is really the human being of, um, uh, of uh, the people that we are managing. So the person is actually the human being. So um, with those few remarks, I'll just uh, like to now pinpoint, and we'll be coming back at the end uh, of this um, uh, launch. Uh, much in uh, when we are discussing much more in uh, and remembering the theme of holistic wellness reset restart and we relearn and we'll be happy for the entire HR fraternity to give us your contributions your thoughts your thinking after we've uh, invited our uh, guest speaker Dr Julius Kipnetich to officially start um, giving us the talk on uh, um, during this HR launch. Um, we all know Dr. Julius Kipnetich. He's been our friend, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, he has been a colleague, our advisor. Um, he's worked with us as the, uh, the HR fraternity through the various, quite so many years. Um, he has been, to me, really quite personal. My mentor, some of you may know that. Uh, my boss <laughs> for very many years, and uh, my consultant, and a lot more of this. And remember, if you believe me or not, He's not an HR expert per se, but he's a real HR person. He's actually a people manager. He has, over the period of time, taken us through various missions. And at one time when he was actually explaining the COVID-19 and how the virus looks like, I could quickly imagine 
and I wondered whether he did medicine. So he'll be telling us a little bit more if he did medicine. I know the profile of um, Dr. Julius Kipnetich is well known, well known within our fraternity. I want to thank the organizers, uh, Secretariat, Rose, very well, and thank you very much, most sincerely, Dr. Kipnetich, for always giving us time when we need you back. And it is really my utmost pleasure to invite Dr. Julius Kipnetich to give us this talk. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Joe. And uh, thank you for your introduction. I hope all of you are hearing me well. And uh, first of all, I, I want to welcome all of you to the HR month, uh, which is basically a people month. I would like us to just clarify a few things. Now that you have called me an HR expert, then I can uh, boldly say a few things. Uh, one is, uh, I think we have to move from calling people resources. We need to call them actually human beings. Just like you have said, German, uh, we are talking about human beings. When you say resources, sometimes we treat them as if there are some coins in the organization. Uh, the human resources are not coins. Uh, they are not some money or some building. They are actually human beings. And I, I, I would like us to probably see how we can upgrade uh, all the architecture of the human management. Instead of calling them resources, we might have to call them something different. I remember in KWS uh, German, we used to call them capital, but we probably need to graduate from capital to something else, probably talent or uh, just call them human beings. But at the end of the day, these people are human beings and they need to be treated as such. I like the theme of your HR month, which is about reset, restart, and relearn. But I think one of the things probably we should have added at the beginning is to unlearn. Part of resetting is actually to relook at the past. And we have to unlearn many things. This disease has changed a lot of how we do things. And so therefore, there are many things we need to begin to unlearn first before we reset, restart, and relearn. But Sorry, before we look at that, we probably have to then just say, where are we now with the disease? I think uh, most of you have been following this pandemic and uh, as it unfolds, it is something the world has not seen. It's even worse than the Spanish flu of 1918. And so therefore it is something which is still unfolding. But just to, to bring you up to, up to speed, uh, I was listening last week to Dr. Fauci, the chief uh, epidemiologist at, in the US, and I'm sure most of you have listened to him on TV. He says, this is a disease like no other. It has never happened. Uh, the world has never seen a disease of this nature because this disease gives you five outcomes that are very confusing. And the challenge is we don't know which human being falls into the five categories. And I'll just quickly follow through them. The US, I'm sure most of you have listened to him on TV. Sorry, Dr. Ari, yeah. if I can interrupt, um, please adjust your camera a little bit. We can't see you. Uh, I know. My office yeah. gives you five outcomes. And, uh, That's a lot better. <laughs> All right, so go ahead. Thanks. Okay, fine. So, Dr. Fauci had talked about that this is a disease like no other, and it gives five outcomes. Those five outcomes are one, they are those the disease doesn't touch at all. Even if you are exposed to it, it doesn't touch you. Then there are those it touches, but doesn't give you a sickness the so-called asymptomatic. And then there are those it touches, but gives a mild outcome, which you can be treated at home. Then there are those who it touches and require hospitalization. Some of them in ICU. And then there are those it kills. Now, this is a disease, therefore, which is very strange, because then we don't know in advance where each human being falls in. Some of the, there have been unscientific explanations for some, 
through statistical inference, which is they have just looked at the statistics and say uh, it, it affects people of this nature. For example, there have been indications that it affects more people with blood group A. I'm one of those. There are some, it says it affects people with underlying condition, largely around two things, diabetes and hypertension. Some of you probably have diabetes, so you statistically, you are on high risk, but medically it has not been proven. And hypertension. And the list can go on as data emerges. At the beginning in the US, for example, the black population thought they were immune to it. And so, because then they say it does not affect Africa, where black people are. But 70% of the deaths in the US are black people. So it's the same thing which has blinded us in Africa, which we say we are in a zone with high temperatures. But there's a country in South America, Ecuador, and even Brazil, that have been severely affected and they're in the equator. So this, there's still a lot of learning. Then the other thing about the disease is that they're still mutating. As we speak now, we are on the ninth version of it and it is still changing. So we are dealing with something which is evolving. Current projections say that 40 to 50% of the world population will get it. So brace yourselves. The worst of this disease is yet to come. So therefore, what does it mean as you as HR practitioners, when you are dealing with a pandemic, a disease which is changing and a disease which will affect eventually 50% of the world population. The 50% of the world population you need to internalize, that is roughly around 4 billion people will be affected by this disease. That is something new. Now, treatment is still far away. Just get to know it. The protocols of approving a vaccine, even if it is fast tracked, at the very minimum is one year away. So the way of handling this disease in a medical way is one year away. So you are talking about roughly around July next year is when a disease, a vaccine will have been found and they begin the rollout. Now, by the time you vaccinate 7.7 uh, .7 billion people in the planet, that will take a while. Even the logistics of it, the production and logistics of the drug will take so long. So just know that the medical path is still a long way to go. Forget about even a cure. A cure is probably five years away or even longer. If you look at, say, HIV, HIV is now has been with us for almost 40 years. I think it was discovered in 81. And up to the date, there is no cure. So I suspect COVID will take the same direction where we might not find a cure, we might find a vaccine, but even the efficacy of a vaccine sometimes can be challenging. If you look at the flu, in the US, the efficacy is around 60%. So that means 40% get, get it even after vaccination. So we are dealing with something which is very complicated, much long term. So I would like then to start sort of the unlearning by just saying, one, there is no post-COVID period. It doesn't exist. This disease is going to be with us. So the first thing you need to reset and just live with it is we are in an era of living with COVID. That's all. Just live with it. And so therefore, the past then has to be unlearned because then the workplace changes completely. Now, some companies have already gone through a shock. Some of them have been, uh, have you have seen layoffs? There will be several companies that just will disappear. In fact, Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, said that just going through COVID, the first stages of COVID, and surviving it is profit enough. 
it's enough profit just to say I survived the first phase, which then the first phase is just probably the next two or three years. If you survive the next two or three years, then you are resilient enough and you can survive the rest of it. As you are aware, the tourism industry already, for example, in Kenya is in trouble and tourism globally is. Okay, our airports are closed, our airlines are down, uh, many hotels are closed, restaurants are closed. And so therefore, anything which requires high human touch is in trouble because of this disease. So therefore, the first reset and restart and relearn is how will tourism be in future? And if, for example, people have invested in hotels, aircraft, they have to rethink how to utilize those assets because then a disease has come that requires low touch. So in the long term, it will be sort of a competition between man and machine. Because a lot of the, the things in the tourism industry requires high touch, then how do we make sure that machines then do much of the work? And that will then increase the challenges of the world in, in things like unemployment. So it's a crisis that we need to think. And it requires people like you in the HR industry to then provide leadership in this new normal. And so therefore, I would like to challenge the HR fraternity here to provide that leadership and just show the world the way. Right now, it's being led by politicians when professionals like you are quiet. So I would like you to be more assertive, uh, more, you know, to do a lot of research. Because a lot of these things is not just about opinions. Anybody can have an opinion. But at the end of the day, the world must be led by the facts that are available at the time so that then we can make quality decisions. So I would like to challenge the HR fraternity as part of relearning to then say, this is a new world. And so therefore, through research, we then provide new policies, new strategies, new ways of living with a disease, which is very complicated and which is also evolving. So it is something I would like you to look at uh, much more strongly. The next thing I would like you to look at as part of the reset is the workplace. This disease, therefore, has make, made us relook at the workplace afresh. I can assure you, you are not going to the workplace prior to March 20th, when we had the first case in Kenya. That workplace has disappeared. And so, therefore, even the way we design things is going to change. There's a word probably some of you are familiar with, which is called ergonomics. Not economics, the subject, but ergonomics, E-R-G-O, which is about the design of the workplace. We need now to rethink the workplace afresh. And the, what, what better person to redesign that workplace than HR people? You need them to say, if we require some level of physical distance, then the workstations, the way we were taught, you know, in the old model, has to be looked at afresh. Outsourcing, for example, where you bring in uh, outside employees like cleaners, where you have no control, have to be rethought as part of the new workplace. Uh, entrances you know, where you, you employees log in in a, in a biometric system has to be rethought and say, instead of now using the thumb, we probably have to find a new way of employees clocking in the morning. Everything has to change. And you have to do it quickly because then as we adjust, as you readmit employees in the, the workplace, most workplaces are not ready. And there has been no studies. You know, if you, some of you, I think when you are doing behavioral science, you did a course, you, you probably learned about the Othon studies, time and motion studies. We probably have to do similar things now in the new workplace and say, 
how does the new workplace work in light of COVID? And so some of you could be the new authors which you are, which are, who are looking at time and motion studies in the workplace. Places like washrooms, you know, they were designed in a pre-COVID world. In a, post, in a living with COVID world, then they have to be rethought and say, if you are sharing a bathroom, how do we know that people are disciplined enough to then keep it clean for colleagues? It looks so basic, but it is at the heart of the transmission of this disease. So everything in the workplace has to be redesigned. And I would like you to provide the leadership in resetting the workplace so that then the workplace is safe for employees to come in and people are responsible. For example, we were debating here in Jubilee whether we need to have CCTV cameras watching over our employees. We are yet to agree what to do, but we are saying somebody has to make sure that the necessary discipline occurs. Then the other thing which has to be uh, rethought completely as a result of then changing the design of the workplace is employee culture. What is culture? Culture is an, a marriage of three things, values, behaviors, and habits. Now, the values of the organization have to be rethought afresh in light of COVID, okay? Some things which were thought are peripheral and can almost be ignored, okay, is how do you relate with colleagues? Because a colleague, a rogue employee, can infect our organization if they, are, if they are malicious, for example. So we need to re-emphasize values in the organization and say what's right and wrong. What's appropriate behavior in the workplace to make it safe and then also to, uh, to make it uh, a place where people have confidence to come and work with and they feel safe. Okay? So it is important that we then relook at employee behavior, employee habits, okay, what do they do from the time they, when they enter the organization. Even things like uh, having tea, it's a very, it's a largely Kenyan habit. They say every time in Kenya is tea time. We have to look at things like those because something, a common place, a tea station becomes now an infection station. You have read about cases online about people get infected because they shared a microwave. People eat food and things like those. Lunch places, you know, many organizations have lunch places for their staff it then becomes a common point uh, where employees crowd. What are you going to do there? So a lot of um, uh, organizational cultures will, will change dramatically. And now if you look at research, research says you need to change, you know, people and learn the past between five to seven years. You don't have that luxury of five to seven years. You have to sort of compress that very quickly and impose new cultures in the workplace against a natural human process of human beings and learning things between five to seven years. So really look at that and say, what are we going to do? How are we going to impose culture quickly even when employees are resisting? Because resist they will, because then you are imposing something quickly over a short period of time, which is against the natural way a human being does things. So some challenge on that front. The third one is, of course, the review of HR policies, rules, and regulations in the workplace. I would like all of you to start looking at this very clearly and say, in light of COVID, what policies must change? what rules must change, what regulations must change. And this will even go all the way up to legislation in the National Assembly. Parliament must also be looking at the Employment Act and say, in light of this pandemic, which is going to be with us for a long time, how do we then recreate new rules so that then if a case goes to court, we are adjudging the case using new act of parliament, 
because then the old act of parliament, the current act does not cover some of the things that have changed in the workplace. So I would like the HR fraternity to provide leadership and just make sure that we change these rules and regulations in light of this. For example, I work for an insurance company. Insurance policies have to change. Ordinarily now, uh, we don't cover pandemics. It's the, it is the, the general rule globally. But we are, as I said earlier on, we are dealing with human beings. So we can't just sit there and say, you are not covered, so we are not paying. So we currently are, dealing, are discussing with our insurance companies and say, we can't behave that way and just ignore uh, our customers. They are human beings at the end of the day, and we must find a way of covering it. So the next time you tender for insurance, we might have to then sit and say, guys, how do we cover issues like COVID? And do we even classify it at that point as a pandemic? And if we do, how do we build in a policy and price the risk? And we are home. So a lot of things are changing and we are also changing ourselves. So it's important for you to then rework all the policies in the organization as you even redesign the workplace under economics. The fourth one is right sizing. I know this is a painful thing, you know, uh, and we have to confront it either way because you see, you cannot give that which you don't have. Many companies have lost their, their sales. Uh, they, some of them didn't have cash reserves. And so to survive a long period where you have no sales. What I want to just, my caution when it comes to right sizing is please just know there is a tomorrow. Don't be too brutal. Uh, to employees because uh, again they are human beings they are not just a resource they are just human beings at the end of the day find a way of mitigating and there are many ideas that are now evolving i'm also researching on it and probably we could discuss this in our next meeting how to have a humane right sizing okay so that then if the, some employees have to go home how do you do it in a humane way those who are staying and how do you make sure that they have a living wage, okay? Look at the challenges going through now in the education industry, where uh, if you are, say, in a private school and you're a teacher, and then the government says you cannot admit students until January 2021, and that's at the earliest. How are you going to pay people when parents have not paid fees? Unless you are a very rich uh, entrepreneur, then you, you must have reserves. Then you can pay these people until that point because you will need them tomorrow anyway. So it's a very interest, a very big dilemma for many, for many organizations on what you do. You tell staff to go away, they go and redo something else because they have to survive. Some of them will become farmers, others become something else, traders. So you will lose the talent that you have developed over a long period of time. So I would suggest, Chairman, that right sizing be looked at in a special way so that then you as a profession work on rules that make it the least painful possible and give companies guidelines so that then they don't, they are, this thing is not done in a, a, a hazard way, it's done in a humane way, because as you said, we are dealing with human beings. The other aspect, number five to that, is the mental wellness of the employees. This disease has come as a shock to everybody, entrepreneurs. You know, you, can you imagine if you build a hotel? You know, Serena had just completed the renovation and before even you reap the benefits, boom, you are forced to close and you don't know what to do. So this disease has given the world a shock and probably you need to work with the medical field because you are, HR practitioners work with psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists, and come up with a mental wellness program for the planet. Provide leadership, reach out to
to other professions and so therefore help people adjust and deal with the trauma. You know, I know the theme is about wellness, but I think the, the critical wellness which is being attacked now is mental wellness. Together with this is physical wellness because then gyms are closed because those are high touch points. They are closed. How do we make sure that the employees are then, even if they are working from home, how do we ensure their wellness? How do we give them programs and uh, communicate to them about how to keep mentally fit? How do they relate with their uh, children, their spouses, in light of uh, you hanging around the whole day? Okay? One of the things that was brought to my attention last week was about uh, employees having back problems. Because in the workplace, we buy for them the right seats. At home, the seats probably they have are just for dinner or lunch. And it, that's 15 minutes, half an hour. But now they have to sit the whole day on a seat which is not appropriate. So we are getting feedback from our employees that some of them are already having back problems. So it they look very simple, but we need them to say, do we invest in the home as a workplace? Because then it's in our interest that the employees are productive. So wellness then as a challenge. So I would like now you as a nature profession to start looking at the house as a workplace. I know if there are issues of privacy, you can't just walk into somebody's home, but as a nature practitioner, the law might probably need to be changed so that then you have access to the new workplace and you assess whether that new workplace is, is right for the level of productivity that you are looking at. I'm sure already data is showing that some employee productivity has increased, others have dropped, depending on the circumstances that they find themselves in. At the beginning of our, when we then uh, released the employees to work from home, we reduced our our staff to less than 20% in the workplace. Now, some of the things that then we, we got from that feedback is some employees have loved working from home. But you see, as we were making decisions initially, because we were imagining everybody lives in a home like us. Then later on, we discovered actually people are having circumstances that may not, not actually be like us. So if you are living, for example, in an SQ, you are hosting your brother, you are hosting your siblings, because probably you are the breadwinner. Now, and there's no place where you can even put a computer and start from the workplace. So, you know, some of these things need to be rethought afresh uh, because the new workplace is not as easy as you probably might imagine. So some HR practitioners might sound elitist and so therefore not appreciate the workplaces that employees are, are working from. So it's important that we look at that and just mention, make sure that one, it's a traumatic place thing to, to be because of the, the disease. And then also physically, is that the right place to work? So, it might mean, for example, that um, uh, some of the things we are thinking of in Jubilee is the definition of the new workplace, which is we have branches, so we want to offload some employees to a branch, okay, rather than working from the headquarters. But then technology can allow that as we then figure out, uh, because we are looking at those employees that were challenged, they don't have a, the right environment at home to work, and we don't, want, we don't have the space in the office for them to come to, then we release some of them. So you will be seeing these past office spaces as we then maintain the distance and the right work environment as we then adjust to this disease. The final thing I'll mention, Chair, is uh, as we think inward, part of the relearning is also thinking outward. Those of you who have learned finance, 
uh, one of the first lessons in finance is companies should not just pursue profit, they need to pursue wealth, wealth creation rather than profit creation. There's a difference between the two. Let me just remind you, profit is short term, which is you maximize today and even at the expense of sacrificing tomorrow. Wealth creation is the long term, thinking long term for the survival of the company and protecting the interest of the shareholder. There's no better time to do wealth creation than now. People will remember what you did when there was a crisis, did you reach out? I would like you to organize part of even mental wellness of us, of your staff is reaching out to the community. Organize them. They can give, they don't know all about money. It could also be mean a lot about time. Organize employees to give their time, to give their energy, to reach out to the less fortunate in our society. They are your future customers. When all this is settled and we have been able to contain this disease, you will require the community where you live, where you work, where, which hosts you. Reach out to them. It is part of your duty of reaching out to other human beings. The, your survival of your company is at stake. As you then look inward to figure out how do you make sure you survive, you also, your survival is also affected by how much you reach out to the community. So I would like you to look at that. And as low, when business is low, what can we do for the community? We may not have money, but we have our hands. We have our heads. We can do many things in our society. So I would like them to challenge you to provide leadership in this new normal. Fast and learn the past quickly and reset a lot of the things in the workplace, reset the minds, reset the structures, reset the way we organize things. And as then we do more research, and I would like you to invest a lot in research. It allows us to have enough data to restart and relearn in light of this new disease, which has permanently altered the way we do business. Thank you, Chairman. Back to you, Chairman. All right. Thank you, Dr. Tari, for your insights. As always, it's a pleasure to, to hear your thoughts um, on various issues. Um, Chairman, would you like to give some remarks? I can see you're muted. Eric, perhaps we could unmute the chair. Yeah, I'm trying to just one minute. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I think uh, Thank you very much. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Back. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, Dr. Tari. I think before we give our overall comments, I'd like you to first take lead, get feedback from um, um, our participants, all of them listening, so that if there are those questions that uh, they could have highlighted or comments, we share in before I give my comments. Rose, please. Right. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Tari, I don't know how much time we have. I know we've beaten into your time so that then we manage it. Okay, I mean, we can do an half an hour. All I right. want to see we are done. All right, okay, that sounds good. Um, I think a couple of questions are coming through. First of all, uh, quite, you know, some compliments to you on the great insights you've shared. So, Asante Sana. Um, Esther is asking, even as we plan to actualize our return to work, how can we maximize on the agility and adaptability of the workplace, especially from um, the public sector perspective. I think she works in a parastatal. Um, so how do we ensure that we have agility and adaptability within the workplace? Okay, thank you, Rose. I think Esther 
there is no special organization, whether you are parastatal, government, private, church, mosque, whatever it is. All of us are affected equally by this disease. So to be agile and adaptable is a natural process. It is just about speed. You have to do it quickly because what was, up, up, what was expected to have taken 10 to 15 years has affected us in just a few months. And so therefore, it's about adapt, adapting quickly because if you don't do it, what are the consequences? The consequences is death of the organization. So a lot of organization are staring uh, bankruptcy in the face. So I would just add Esther, whether you are parastatal or a church or a government or a profit making organization, you have to do this adjustment quickly, very fast. So uh, you have to do it then therefore now online. There is no more Naivasha. You can't go to Naivasha for the usual things that you guys do in parastatals. So what do you do? You have to sit quickly and, and adjust and, and learn the past and learn the future. In between, of course, there has to be a lot of sharing. I would like uh, in the Institute to provide a platform for sharing a lot of experiences because this is new for everybody. So provide the platform so that then they're sharing and then adopt quickly because there is no choice. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So what are some of the things that you're doing in Jubilee, especially from a HR policy perspective? I think that's coming out quite a bit um, in the questions from the members. Perhaps just share your insights um, around that. Okay, so thank you, Ross. I think uh, we, we have a, a, initially when the crisis came, we had a daily meeting Monday to Friday with the top leadership team to help employees adjust and work from home. And that was quick because then it came suddenly. And then later on when now we had settled the employees with the technology, with the processes, we then focused on then uh, living with COVID. We then, of course, as the medical teams were telling us, this thing is not going away. You have just to live with it. So we then now adjusted and said, okay, well, let's meet less frequently. So we now meet twice a week. And we then now discuss more medium term issues. In the first phase, we had secured the company and protected our customers, made sure that you know, people are renewing their insurance policies. So protection of what we have. We are not very uh, adventurous now in getting new customers because that's also tricky. So we then say, let's protect our customers first, protect the business as is. And I can say largely 90% of the business is protected. Then now we are in the phase of return to work. So a lot of our discussions now is focusing on return to work. Uh, our employee, uh, the current policy is we only admit 40%. And at least we, until we stabilize the 40%, but that 40% is in two, two uh, shifts. And these shifts don't meet. So one shift comes and then to the workplace and then the other shift works at home and they don't meet. The reasoning is if one is contaminated, then we can still survive because then work can continue when one team is, is, uh, is, is at home and isolated. And so we are monitoring that, that the shift works well. Then that I told you earlier on, we were thinking of how do we make sure that the employees are maintaining the discipline? Because you preach to people, we, we, there, are, there are two messages that we pass to staff every day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon about new developments, what they need to do, you know, what they, if they need to stretch in the office and things like those. So it's, it's, it is just continuous communication as information emerges. And then of course, we are now in the face of, you know, in light of all these things, uh, uh, government is, is talking about, they have reopened and things like those. We are in the face now of thinking, how does that affect the business? For example, 
we know, you know, insurance policies for schools will lapse because they are closed. Because now we have a more long-term uh, framework. And then things like, you know, uh, some of them have been positive. Uh, you people visit hospitals less. So our cost ratios have come down in, in the health insurance. So a lot of things are, are being adjusted and we are learning. And we are saying in the renewal time in January, most of you renew in January, I know you'll be discussing, give us a discount now that there are less hospital visits. So we are, we are learning as we are going along. And uh, so that is the way we are adjusting roles. There are many other details I can't say here, but what we are saying is that it's about the framework of providing employees with a discussion forum where they discuss the adjustment process. I believe twice a week is good enough. Some of you probably meet daily, some probably meet once a week, but once two weeks is too long. Don't go beyond once a week. So then you are adjusting the organization as new information emerges. So another key aspect has been productivity and management of productivity in light of the new normal. Yeah. Um, perhaps share your insights around, you know, some of the ways that you see us managing this going forward, because ultimately business must continue, but at the same time, you know, employee welfare is key as well. Okay. There are some cultural challenges that we have in this part of the world that we have just to take uh, cognizance of. One of them is individual discipline. I don't think, I know we go to church and uh, we sound very religious, but some of our behaviors are not religious at all. And it has to do with the way we value our dignity and how we give our labor when you get a salary at the end of the month. There are people who are not guilty that they have earned a salary they have not worked for. And we have many people like that. So we just have to accept that we have a cultural challenge in this part of the world where people are not honest enough, even those who say they are saved. And many of you in this forum know my views of people who are saved. And I'll not go beyond that. So we need them to start thinking through and say, how do we make sure that our employees account for their time wherever they are, whether they are at home or inside a car or in the office. So one of the things uh, we have introduced and with something which is very basic is a timesheet. There is a software called Clockify and you can Google it. Clockify is basically an online timesheet where employees account for their time. And we have implemented this now for one month and we'll keep continuously review. So that then an employee, wherever they are, will tell us exactly what they did from whatever, so then we can, at the end of the month, judge, did they actually do something worth paying for? In the last forum, we talked about adjustments to, of compensation systems to pay to peace rates rather than time-based compensation. And that could be a challenge, for example, to institutions like government, but we have no choice, but we have to evolve towards peace rates, which is we only pay you if you justify what you did. So I would like you to start thinking of one, let's go to timesheets. I think we have no, 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 um, no choice but to go to timesheets, people employing, and then an evolution to peace rates where employees are paid based on pr productivity. Then all joyriders in organizations will have something else to go and do. So I think that time has come and we just have no choice. So that therefore output is paid for based on your effort rather than just time hanging around. That's the future. Thanks, Ross. Thank you, Dr. Terry. I think the elephant in the room as well uh, is around digital HR and and relearning the skill and ensuring implementation. Um, any thoughts on that as to how we can then begin to unlearn what we have and relearn the digital space because then we can't run away from it. 
I think digital is everywhere, not just HR. Uh, as I told you, uh, and, and, you, and you know, that um, we are going into a low touch economy. This disease has just made, has accelerated the adoption of that, uh, of digitization, because digitization is about low touch. So COVID and digitization are good bedfellows. So therefore, we just need to start saying, how do we then manage people digitally? Manage people digitally means we now use the gadgets and the technology as it emerges so that we monitor what they do uh, using the smartphone. So we need then to find, figure out how do we manage employees using the smartphone? You know, we can, for example, know their location, the, the phone, tell you the location of the employee. We can, through systems like Clockify, we can measure and even more, some are even more accurate. Those who, who are dealing with transactions, we can measure how many transactions you process in a day or in an hour, whatever it is. So the future is digital and COVID has just affirmed digitization. So make sure that everything you do is you invest in technology. Now the challenge with many HR practitioners, and I know you'll, you will uh, crucify me by saying it, is that many HR practitioners have low knowledge of IT. I'm not asking you to be IT experts. I'm asking you to appreciate IT so that you can frame your needs to IT professionals. So start familiarizing yourself. Probably we need a course of say IT for non-IT managers. In the same way you people do HR for non-HR managers. You do the opposite, which is IT for non-IT people. You need to have some basic knowledge of how technology works so that then you can frame your needs. And so therefore you help in the digitization of HR as a profession, HR as a practice, HR in managing people. Of course, there will be some dilemmas uh, that will emerge. One of the biggest dilemma is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is about you know, prying into people's privacy. How will we manage that? We have now the Data Protection Act. Let's see who the first data commissioner will be. There will be some controversy in, on how they lay the foundation on how they are going to protect people's privacy. But we can test the limits as HR practitioners on how much you can pry to employee life using a smartphone uh, without breaching uh, human decency and the law. So there are many things that you need to understand. So new technology is coming. Uh, for example, um, I know we are doing using Zoom now, but what is coming is even more interesting, called augmented reality and holograms. I want you to go and read about holographics, holograms, and augmented reality. So that then you can have a meeting which mimics physical meeting. You can actually see the people, but they are not physically there. So there are, there's a lot of new technology which is coming. So I would like you to start thinking through how do we then use augmented reality in light of COVID now? Artificial intelligence. What is the limit of artificial intelligence? Blockchains. How do we use blockchains in understanding and building algorithms so that then you can understand uh, people more? So there are many things that are emerging from the technology world that we need to learn about. So it's not just digital HR, it's about digital everything. Thanks, Ross. Indeed, as you rightly said, it's about digital everything. Um, so Dr. Tari, we wanna say a big thank you for your time. As always, it's great listening to you. And you know what they say, knowledge is like perfume. You can always give it to someone without losing any of it yourself. So Asante Sana, thank you so much for your thoughts. So because of time, allow me to um, invite the chairman. And, but while he comes on board, perhaps Dr. Tari, in just two minutes, 
Yeah. Give us your final thoughts before Chairman can then take over from here. Okay, my, my, my final thoughts, uh, Rose, is that uh, a new world order is emerging. And it's not just uh, about, you know, the usual things, companies and what. It's about the human race, the survival of the human race. It's also about the survival of the workplace as we know it. As I told you, forget about the workplace pre-March 20th. That, that one has disappeared. You know, if you, I think, if you are still thinking that you can bring employees to that workplace that you had before COVID, that one has disappeared. It's now you to start saying, what is this new world? And that's why I say create a platform for you to share because everybody's learning. Then I believe in research. Research enables you to look at data, okay? I, I'm sure you have heard of the maxim, uh, uh, trust in God, everybody else must bring data. So the only trust you can have is God. Everybody else must bring data. Adam Ganga must bring data. So it is important that we now appreciate the importance of research so that then we are a data-driven society. We are driven by the facts rather than emotional opinions of so many people. So I would like the Institute to start now focusing. Wellness is all about research. What works, what doesn't work? So it's important that you always focus on that. And probably the final thing is where the chairman started, which is you are the most important profession in the whole world going forward. And I would like to see HR practitioners occupy the C-suit office, those who understand people. Because going forward, those who understand human beings will win. Those who don't understand human beings will lose. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I think, Chairman, we leave the platform to you now for your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Terry. That was really insightful and helpful to all of us. And as usual, you bring new perspectives in um, people management all the time you get to speak to us. Uh, your parting shot is really indeed very powerful. And uh, talking about the new world order, it's uh, about survival of the human being, the human race. I think that underlines almost everything and sums it up telling us that the people managers, as we now we want to address ourselves, are the most important profession going forward. I really, really, really appreciate you, Dr. Terry, and this is really quite insightful. We'll be taking in all these things as, we, um, as our learnings as we go into our HR month. And uh, therefore, I, before I forget, I also want to acknowledge um, the, some of the people who are with us in this um, launch including the council members and uh, Bill Dutt, the coast uh, representative is here with us, seated right uh, across there. Bill Dutt, say Jambo. Hello. Thank you <laughs> okay. very much. Thank you very much. Is the council member representing the coast uh, region. And we have uh, council members present. Uh, they have already checked in. Uh, I really appreciate you. We've had a whole day engagement today, starting from very early in the morning. Uh, I want you to acknowledge the chair of uh, the college uh, board, Dr. Tony Nasirembe, and the chair of HR and PEP, Dr. Sharon Kisire, who is also a colleague. Uh, thank you very much, all the members who have come in. I believe that we've learned a lot. Um, as we launch this program, remember that we are going outside. The basic, um, the primary reason for HR month is time really to get, and there's no better time than now when you're actually reaching out to the society. And what I take from Dr. Kipne Teach now is that what we are going to preach out there during this HR month is individual discipline. Remember, if we do not have that self-individual discipline, then all these things are. And so for a moment, we are going to forget the technical nature because it is secondary. We have to just go back to the 
basics like for example you have your lift you can't change it and the lift is limited to three or four people what is that individual discipline as i saw it uh, last week an individual just wants to push it so that we are fine what for you know and you should have the courage of stopping at uh, um, certain um, cultures and certain habits that we uh, we are used to so the process of unlearning will um, arguably uh, must be very quick. We are, you know, we are, the Dr. you told us it is uh, normally, under normal circumstances, five to seven years to unlearn a habit, and we want to do it in a month, which we, we really have, uh, will be forced to do all that. And um, it has been really quite insightful. It is really my privilege for all those members who are seated and listening in, and I want to thank the Secretariat for organizing this, and I believe that all of us who have signed in will be awarded one CBD point, isn't it so? Yeah. And we are very happy with that because we've really learned a lot. Uh, so we believe that Dr. Kipnetit's uh, lessons are really quite powerful and will help us in our professions. I don't want to sum it up as I think Rosa has um, um, said that we are really running out of time. Uh, I'm going to take it back to the technical team, thanking you very much. And once we take care, and I remember Kipnetit, this is what he used to tell us in KWS, once you take care of God's creation, then God takes care of you. So with that, I believe that we are going to take very good care of God's creation, which is the human being as people managers. I thank you very much, and may God bless you abundantly. Rose and the Secretariat Organizers team, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Council members. I think before I sign off, there's a video to be played. I think uh, we, it will be interesting that we watch this video before we close.